Okay, welcome to this uh, webinar hosted by Sense Metrics and Measuran. There is a strong working relationship between the two of our companies, uh, one of which we are very proud of, and uh, we look forward to, to co-presenting this webinar. Today, we are going to talk about cloud technology for subsurface deformation monitoring, and in particular, how to remotely monitor and control your cloud-connected sensor networks in three easy steps. My name is Alex Pinar, and I'm the director of mining here at SenseMetrics. And with me from SenseMetrics is Ben Lowry. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. I'm the senior geoinformatics engineer with SenseMetrics, and uh, here to, to chat with you uh, specifically about sensor networks and the mining space and how easy it is to, to set up one of our great sensors, uh, the Shape Array from Measurand. And I'm here with, uh, with the, the team from Measurand, uh, Chris and Shane. Uh, thanks, Ben and Alex. Uh, it's great to be here. I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe in these uh, kind of unprecedented times. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm a geomedics engineer and the director of sales at Measurand and joining uh, us today is Shane Spinney, our su support specialist. Hi everyone. Thanks. So let's just uh, let's dive right in. Uh, I guess I should point out that uh, we are live as we're doing this. We're currently in three different cities, uh, all working from home, as most of you probably are right now. Um, this will be kind of interactive. So as we're going along, on the right hand side, you can see there's a chat window and some questions. Uh, please ask along if there's any slides. If you want some questions on stuff, please let us know. We'll try to answer them as we're as we're going, if it makes sense. Uh, if we don't get to it during the presentation, we'll, there's a Q&A session at the end. Um, if we still didn't have time to get to it, we will follow up uh, later today or tomorrow individually and answer all of your questions. So please uh, please just let us know as we're going um, and we'll be happy to try to, uh, to answer those as we go along. So a quick overview of what we'll be going over today. Uh, first, we'll dive into an overview of the mining industry as a whole. Um, kind of historically and in this current climate and where we see it moving into the future. Um, an overview of both of our companies and our technologies and how we work together, as Alex mentioned earlier. Uh, and then we'll get into kind of three easy steps for how you can actually get the data from the ground, from our instrument, uh, into kind of your office and your engineer's hands so you can make a, do some data analysis uh, with that. And then we'll go over a case study where this has been done before and show you some examples of kind of the data that you can see from uh, our systems. Thanks, Chris. Um, so so let's let's get to it. Um, it has been an extraordinary few months, and, and we're now starting to come to grips with the world and an industry that will be fundamentally different from, from here on forward. And taking a closer look at the mining industry, uh, we are starting to see a, a few trends. Um, and when we look at these trends, we see that safety will always be a focal point and the factors that drive safety on a mine site will continue to, to do so. An integral part here is site-wide monitoring. So sensors that are easy to install and, and that are easy to, to use will become a very important consideration um, as we move forward. We're also seeing many operations implementing staggered shifts and work from home policies. And these measure, measures will continue to put an emphasis on seamless and dynamic information sharing. We look at time on site. Uh, time on site will become increasingly expensive, uh, not necessarily in direct dollar terms, but in terms of changes to our everyday routines. All of a sudden, the number of occupants in a truck is no longer limited by the number of seat belts, but rather by social distancing measures. So going out to the field, uh, would either require more trucks or it would need to be prioritized over, over some other pressing issue. Uh, finally, we are seeing mining companies relocating their workforce to remote operational centers, uh, with these centers requiring the proper monitoring and risk management tools uh, to be put in place so that the proper and correct decisions can be made. Um, and the blueprint for success is already in the making. Uh, together with Measurand, we recently successfully automated, and when we talk about automated, meaning from the time where the sensor is installed to near real-time data streaming um, accessible on any phone or tablet in one and a half hours uh, without the OEM putting a foot inside. Uh, we are going to reference this new normal throughout the presentation. We want you to think about the impact of these factors on your operation. Uh, so please feel free to provide your comments, your thoughts, um, share similar stories with us in the comments section. Um, but let's dive in a little bit deeper. Chris, please tell us a bit more about the very unique uh, Measurehand technology. 
Oh, sure. Thanks, Alex. So a uh, quick overview uh, from maybe some of you who may not know who we are. Measurand is a company based on the east coast of Canada. Uh, we were established in 93, began building the Shape Array in 2004, 2005. And since then, we've uh, that's our only product. We've shipped uh, 150,000 meters of this all over the world. We have uh, many, many patents in different applications and installations and technologies, and we have uh, 19 distributor partners around the world and many other uh, partners in North America. So for those, of, again, who have never seen it, you can kind of think of a shape array as a, people like to call it either a, an electrified garden hose or a, uh, a uh, IPI on a reel, uh, something like that, um, or a flexible inclinometer is another word people sometimes call it. But essentially what it is is an instrumented flexor. Um, it's basically rigid segments separated by flex flexible joints. Inside each one of these rigid segments is a MEMS accelerometer measuring uh, tilt in three dimensions and a temperature sensor. Um, it arrives completely calibrated, uh, shipped on a reel. We build everything in-house to the ordered length. Um, so when it gets on site, there's no no on-site calibration, no on-site uh, assembly. It's ready to be installed as soon as you get to site. So the typical uh, shape array can be installed in three separate ways. Um, on the left of the screen, you'll see the vertical installation. And the way we uh, define vertical is anything that's 60 degrees from vertical. Um, in that case, it'll measure lateral movements in two dimensions and then calculate the third dimension based on those tilts and the known segment length. So you can actually get 3D data from those installations. The casing sizes can be can range from uh, 27 millimeter or one inch up to anything between 47 and 100 mil. So uh, basically one inch to uh, four inch uh, ID conduit. Uh, there's no extra grouting once the SA is installed into the conduit in that case. Same instrument can also be installed horizontally. Uh, we define horizontal as anything from vertical or from 30 degrees from horizontal. Uh, in that case, you will measure settlement or heave data, so you'll end up with two-dimensional data. Again, the same instrument can also be put uh, in an arc installation, so for instance, around the interior of a tunnel to measure any changes uh, in convergence. So this is just another visual representation of what I just mentioned, the three separate installation types. This is kind of giving you um, just an idea of how this would work. Uh, we do have a flexibility, which I can get into later if you like, when it's installed vertically on the left of the screen. Um, you, The sensorized zone needs to be continuous, but we offer what we call extension tubes or silent segments, which are essentially kind of unsensorized sections that can help you target the sensorized zone and, and save cost for the entire length of the instrument. Uh, in the middle is a picture of a typical horizontal installation where the shape array is installed into a one, two or three inch size ID conduit. Uh, this is just a trans installation where they would then cover it and you can measure any settlement or heave in that case. And again, uh, inside the interior of a tunnel to measure changes in convergence. In this case, it's in one inch PVC conduit, which is just bolted to the inside of the tunnel. We offer three models of shape array. Um, we have on the right side of the screen is the SA scan model, which is kind of a purpose built um, tool typically used on construction sites to by drillers when they're trying to verify the accuracy of their drilling. So they'll insert it into a hole they've just drilled, take a measurement, reel it back up, move it around, maybe make sometimes dozens of readings every day. Uh, on the left of the screen is the SAX uh, model, which is our horizontal installation only. Um, so it's only used to measure settlement or heave. Uh, it's, it comes in 1000 millimeter segment lengths. Um, and in the middle is our SAV model, which is our newest and uh, let's say our most versatile uh, shape array. It can be installed vertically, horizontally, or in an arc. And again, it can uh, it comes in 250 millimeter segments or 500 millimeter segments. Thanks, Chris. Um, so looking at the at the sensmetric side of things here today, um, we have two offices in the United States, one being in sunny San Diego, which is not so sunny at the moment, the other office being in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we have active projects with over 75 engineering and consulting firms, system integrators, government agencies, municipalities, and large enterprises that are currently using the SenseMetrics platform. We've established a network of resellers across the Americas. It's Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, and Peru, as well as in Europe and in Australasia. Today, we are hosting over three, 300 million real-time geotechnical observations um, on our on our platform in real time. So Sensmetrics provides an end-to-end -end solution 
that effortlessly connect sensor networks, monitoring workflows and decision makers. Um, and in so doing, we are able to centralize sensor data into a single source of truth. And we provide real-time data insight across an entire organization. Ben, you've seen the very practical application and the corresponding results in terms of improved decision making and increased efficiency across the mine site. Absolutely. And, and it really comes into this idea that in order to understand a mine site, you want to understand different aspects and use different sensors. Uh, in fact, there's a whole diversity of, of sensors, of total stations and piezometers, flow meters that someone needs to understand their what's going on at their, their project. Uh, so we typically are engaged with lots of different types of sensors in different applications. Uh, we primarily work in the slope stability aspect of monitoring pit slopes, uh, pit movements on, on slope walls. Uh, we work in, in a dewatering monitoring uh, where we're monitoring groundwater levels, pumping rates, uh, looking at pumping tests from a kind of hydrogeological standpoint and those sensors. Um, that crosses uh, over to, to tailings dam facilities, which have been, you know, a, a very high visibility uh, monitoring uh, objective for lots of companies, mining companies out there, especially with these, um, uh, you know, tragic failures that we've seen in the last few years. Uh, and then they also crossed over into just environmental monitoring then. So, uh, you know, looking at groundwater quality, uh, streamwater quality, um, weather monitoring, uh, all of those, all of these sensors require different types of uh, interfaces in order to, to, to bring them together and usually have different types of software if you just take the kind of proprietary, here's the software that's used to monitor this. So SenseMetrics collapses and centralizes all of that into uh, one interface and, and brings that together into a, an ecosystem where they can all, you can look at all of that same data in the same way. So one of our, our best uh, implementations of this sensor is, is that of the, the shape array with Measurant. And we'll show you in this presentation exactly how we achieve that uh, through a couple of different ways, but uh, placing, placing uh, the subsurface monitoring data that Measurant produces amongst the, the ecosystem of sensors that, that are at a mine site is, it, it really increases the value of, of that sensor and it increases the value of all of the other sensors. So, it's a nice force multiplier in, in the mining space. One of the other things that's important to, to talk about with SenseMetrics is just the security of, of the cloud and how we handle uh, cloud security and, and uh, cloud telemetry. So we have these gateway boxes, they're called threads. These are these white boxes that are placed near the sensor. Uh, and then they, they mesh together intelligently uh, through encrypted protocols, and then forward that data up to a cloud platform. Uh, this cloud platform has, you know, extreme security, uh, world-class sort of standards of, of uh, security, so that the data is always secure, but it's also accessible to the people that need to see it. And that makes for a, a tremendous collaborative opportunity between engineers, site owners, even regulators uh, can, can bring and, and look at the, the one single source of truth uh, data in the same place. And, uh, you know, we, we work with questions about, you know, well, how do, I, how do I access that data? You know, where do I get, uh, can I download that data all the time? And I'll just kind of preview that conversation that SenseMetrics is really committed to this idea of, keeping the ownership of the data with the customer so that data can be uh, mirrored back to site, it can be backed up, it can be downloaded, exported. Uh, a lot of our customers still use Excel uh, when they want, really want to crack open a deep dive on the data. And so we have lots of different tools and capabilities for, for working with that data export. But it really comes back to this idea that you own the data and it's your data to do what you want with it. And we want to make it as useful and as valuable uh, to you in the process. So um, we'll explore a little bit on the case study at the end of the presentation about what it looks like to take that data all the way up into a, a modeling environment in a, in a frictionless way that 
that allows you to take the data collected at the sensor and move it into a point where you're actually making decisions off of that data. Uh, and so it's a, it, it's a really important aspect of, of creating value within uh, an organization and, and driving that value. So uh, Alex, I think you have a, a, a preview into the, those value drivers within an organization. Absolutely, Ben, and these value drivers are, are so important because they're able to effectively collapse cost, complexity, and risk across an entire monitoring program. Uh, they really remove all of the barriers or, or friction points endemic to traditional technological approaches. And when looking at these value drivers, we are particularly, particularly referring to the increased efficiency where secure cloud-hosted data removes the need for time-consuming infrastructure maintenance. We're looking at improved productivity, uh, where real-time data streams allow engineers to gain immediate insight and make faster, more informed decisions. Uh, better scalability, where edge devices provide plug-and-play connectivity, uh, greatly reducing startup time and cost of expansion products, projects. And of course, more flexibility, where information is quickly and securely shared, um, increasing data visibility across the organization, as well as to external stakeholders. And what you're going to see today is how easily a shape array can be connected into the SenseMetrics cloud platform, and that this capability is different and faster um, and easier than any other solution on the market. And that we've seen that how it changes an instrumentation program and how it changes how you think about an instrumentation program. Uh, but before we get into that, um, let's look at a few key concepts with regards to the industrial Internet of Things. Great. So, so there's a lot of buzzwords in this space. Uh, we, we have there's a lot of kind of techie buzzwords that are worth uh, discussing because they they have some impact on exactly how we're we're working, especially in the, the shape array example with SenseMetrics. So, uh, industrial Internet Internet of Things is is shortened sometimes to IIoT, and so this is really a the idea of uh, instrumentation and data loggers, automated collection, they've been around for decades, but uh, it's kind of being adopted into this IoT space of big data and uh, analytics because the, the, the data is going to the cloud. The data is being sent up through the internet and, and then lives in a place that it can be consumed. And I think that the big moment for, for instrumentation is that how you do that transformation and what that looks like is is an important context of of changing how we think about how valuable the data is it's not just meant to to go and live in a in a database on a, a dusty server in a mine office it actually can be consumed by analytical applications and uh as you'll see really be leveraged to make decisions instead of just collecting data so uh we talk about plug and play uh which is a common term, but for in instrumentation, we all know that that's, that's not that easy to do. Uh, we've achieved it in a really great way with uh, MeasureRan's Shape Array that, you know, there are aspects of automating the configuration of a sensor that SenseMetrics and MeasureRan work very well together at achieving. So we'll walk you through what that looks like, and we're just trying to eliminate those manual uh, touch points of an integrator having to go in and you know set a serial number or upload calibration files or you know insert calibration constants uh, we want to try and eliminate as many steps as possible while still keeping a, a high definition uh, uh, sensor uh, configuration available um, there's also this idea of edge computing so i mentioned that we have these uh these thread gateway devices and they, they live next to the sensor so so that's the concept of having we ha basically have a computer at the edge of our sensor network and we can do really interesting things with that that computer so not only can we read data in it functions not just as a data logger but a data streamer but we can then do things with that data and interact with that sensor in interesting ways so we'll explore that uh what that edge computing model looks like. Uh, cloud computing, again, this idea that all of the data is going up to a cloud database. Uh, that's not just a simple server that's hosted in the cloud. That's not just a, oh, I have a virtual machine that's in a, a server farm and it lives on a Windows device. It's in fact a, a, a suite of technologies that are meant to be scalable. So you don't worry about data storage anymore. You don't worry about processing 
capabilities because that is meant to be scaled with the power of technologies like Microsoft Azure and Amazon AWS so that that capability is growing with the need of the number of sensors connected, the number of users connected, and it's no longer a limitation that, that applies uh, as it has the last few decades with, you know, oh, should I be collecting that because I'm going to fill up a hard drive? Or we, we can't put that many, you know, uh, lines on a graph because we don't have the processing power to run it off of one CPU. So really important to, you know, know that that's, there are a lot of, of boundaries that are broken when you have a cloud computing model. And probably one of the most important ones, as I've talked about, the idea of sharing data and moving data in between different systems is that of an API. So the application programming interface, an API is a, a mechanism for different platforms to push data back and forth between each other. Uh, this, is, this is what allows uh, data to be subscribed to. You can, you can send data automatically. You can uh, get access to real-time data in other applications besides just the SenseMetrics uh, uh, browser tab. It can be feeding into uh, groundwater modeling applications, limit equilibrium analysis. Uh, we have it feeding into you know, uh, larger uh, real-time alerting uh, reverse 911 type of systems. So there's all types of uh, connections here that are really important uh, to consider with, with how that cloud data becomes useful. Um, so so those, those are just some of those terms uh, of, of, of art that are out there, but if you guys have any questions, please feel free to, to uh, flag that somebody's you know, used a, uh, a word that you would like a definition to, and, and we'll address that in, in the questions as well. Hey Ben, just uh, I'm going to chime in while you were while you were t uh, talking about those four points. I just wanted to do mention something that often comes up when we at Measurant are talking to clients. Um, it's a few things you you said, uh, especially the basically the limitless storage ability of a cloud-based system, because you can imagine a shape race. Sometimes we build these 150, even 200 meters in length, and each one of those is a half meter segment. So we're looking at sometimes up to 400 individual segments. Each one of those has four pieces of data, X, Y, Z, temperature. So we're looking at 800. Uh, pieces of data for every single reading. So I know Shane can attest to this too. Sometimes clients will be collecting data once every 10 minutes for years and years and years, and they've got this giant file size. So they actually have to worry about storage stability. So the fact that basically the cloud is limitless is uh, is a nice, very attractive uh, feature. And the fact that, uh, as you brought up, the clients own the data. It's not uh, it's out there that it's available to anyone to download. We'll get into that more of that later. But I just thought I'd mention that since uh, it's a really important point that you you brought up. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, good point. Great point. So I think that from here, uh, uh, we'll go ahead and, and jump into just the configuration of what a platform, uh, a sensor installation for ShapeRay looks like. So I think that, Chris, you have a, a video to kick us off on that. We said there was three easy steps. Uh, the first of these is installing the ShapeRay. So uh, just I'll, I'll give everyone a quick disclaimer. As we start the video, my sound might cut out for a few seconds, but uh, so don't worry, it's not your system. Uh, it might just go silent for a few seconds as we turn it back on. So we'll go ahead and start this video now, and then I'll be back. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks everyone. So as I as I showed earlier, the shape array arrives fully calibrated and built to the direct direct length uh, on a reel. So it arrives on site. It is ready for installation as soon as you get it. So you would stand it one to two meters away from your installed casing. In this case, we're using standard inclinometer casing. Uh, we have uh, fixtures that will install in either kind of in kilometer casing, or it can go into virtually any size casing from one inch up to three inches in length. So the shape ray uh, installs directly off the reel into the casing. Uh, there's a spring at the top. If you use anything that's bigger than the one inch conduit, uh, that helps hold it in compression in place. Uh, what's sticking out of the hole right now is called is one of those extension tubes, which I referred to earlier. These are used to help keep um, the shape ray in compression and at the right height, so it's flush with the top of the casing. There's a single communication cable that comes out of the top of the shape array, which you saw there, that can then be hooked directly into the thread interface. Uh, it's always one cable, regardless of the number of segments. What uh, is being screwed in there is the spring that holds it in place. 
there's a green casing cap that it basically protects uh, from the elements, keeps water, dust, and all those things mostly out of it. Uh, and that's the entire installation process right there. So I may cut out again quickly as we switch back to the presentation. Uh, nope, all good. Perfect. So uh, that was the process of actually installing a shaper. It's very easy. Um, it doesn't take uh, a lot of even, even, even I can do it. It's uh, very easy. And then on the outside of the thread, um, this is what we talk about the plug and play. So as opposed to kind of some other systems, the installing a shape ray onto a thread is literally plug and play. So there's two device ports on the outside of each thread. So you can hook two shape rays regardless of the length into it. And uh, once it's plugged in, uh, it'll automatically detect how it's installed, the serial number, get the calibration file. And you can start to see data on the SenseMetrics platform within minutes of installing the instrument. So the whole process, uh, as you can see, is very efficient. Yeah, and, and you know, what's really worth emphasizing there, as I was talking about all of these different features of uh, edge computing and API, so uh, the thread is actually looking to the servers that, that are uh, out in the cloud and bringing that calibration file into the cloud platform and then applying the correct voltages to the shape array based on the length of segments and all of the, the calibration files that were generated at uh, uh, the New Brunswick offices. So you know that capability that is automated it happens behind the scenes that so you don't have to do anything you know to to manually apply those we just thought through that workflow and realized that you know the vast majority of things can be automated in a way that it takes out all of that pain of having to configure and manually program your device to to set readings and things like that um one thing that's important about the the sense metrics platform is that we've we've put all of the configuration for all of the devices inside the browser there's no back end there's no programming you don't have to write code to, to make this work uh, all of that capability for setting the ver you know vertical installation what the fixed end is uh you know even setting just reading the serial number off makes sure that you can do management of your platform in a very rapid way uh you can take readings uh in an, in an automated basis, you can set the reading frequency, or you can just manually take a reading now uh, just by pressing a button in the browser. So that capability is is, is built into the platform. And if we look at the the how we're actually uh, calculating, you know, the, working with the data, uh, this is an important point too. Uh, Chris, can you talk a little bit about? just how you actually take the, the raw data and, and turn it into uh, information about the subsurface? Sure, um, that's a great point. I'll quickly back up. So when we calibrate the shape arrays in the office, it generates what the, well, obviously we call a calibration file, which is essentially custom for every shape array. Um, and what it essentially does is contains all the data that takes that raw data that's collected from the instrument and then turns that into usable engineering units. Um, so the data that comes out of each shape array uh, has to be run through this either converter or something, a uh, piece of our software that will access this calibration file, which we've, we've referred to a few times now, uh, and then convert that data for you. This is, on other systems, this may be a manual process or at least a manual configuration at the start, but with um, with using threads, Sensemetrics and MeasureAnd have spent many, many years perfecting this kind of plug and play solution. So once we generate that calibration file at MeasureAnd, it's uploaded to an FTP server. Uh, the thread, as I mentioned, detects the serial number once it's plugged in, actually pulls that calibration file automatically so the user doesn't need to do anything, and then can start to automatically generate um, real deformation or shape data using that calibration file. So as Ben mentioned, you can see that kind of that real-time data on your phone or on your tablet within uh, within minutes of being installed. So all of this happens behind the scenes. The user experience is very seamless and very straightforward, and uh, I'm I'm quite happy with it. No, and, and we really like that side of it too. I've I've set up uh, systems um, with uh, much more kind of manual integrations and you know the configuring data loggers and programming that it. it it takes a long time, uh, a lot of effort to to get up and going with a project, and you know to have to have a tablet at the drill hole site and and have the data streaming in in real time is a really satisfying moment. 
uh, that uh, we're we're very excited to be able to have uh, the shape array as part of our our portfolio of sensors that we can support uh, because it's it it really is satisfying to see that real time data right after the installation. Uh, I wanted to just pause and uh, take a look at some of the questions that are coming through. Thank you all for for taking a look at uh, asking such good questions. Uh, I wanted to just mention um, some simple answers here. Uh, the shape array is uh, is meant to be installed in a uh, in a borehole casing, um, so it does it, it's not something that you can can drive in like a driven piezometer. Um, but I guess Chris, do you want to talk about the the flexibility on that uh, the borehole casing and exactly how that uh, shape array will can can uh, use any any size of of borehole casing? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the we have a patented um, we call it the cyclical installation. Um, I can follow up later and I can provide all of the details and images and how this may may work. But essentially. What it does is, if you think of putting kind of flexible, kind of like a, anything with flexible joints into a larger conduit, it'll kind of zigzag its way down. Um, I mentioned during the installation video that it's held in compression. So it's capped at the bottom. So the bottom of the shape array will sit on the bottom of the casing. The top is a spring to hold it in compression, and it will just kind of zigzag its way down in three dimensions. Our patented cyclical algorithm will actually look at the tilt of each of those individual segments and determine the position. And then from there, you can get millimeter accuracy of deformation of shape from that initial starting position. Um, what this allows us to do is that you can install, this This algorithm will work in any size diameter casing, anything from, um, actually, we've actually installed into 25 millimeter ID casing before, anything up to 100 millimeter ID. That's what we've tested. Uh, that's what we know will give you that 1.5 millimeter level accuracy. So you're not tied to any type of casing. You can retrofit casings that have been um, drilled in way back 20, 30 years ago that haven't been used in 20 years. You can actually retrofit those with brand new SAVs if you have that option. We've done that a few times, and actually those are collecting data on threads now that I think of it. But um, hopefully that answered the question. If you have any need any more info, please follow follow up with me, and I'll uh, I'll address these after. And just the other question that I see in here uh, from from Tony. Uh, the idea of the third dimension um, being measured. So, you know, just quickly, the the MEMS accelerometers they're always seeing the the acceleration from gravity, so they'll always see the the gravity uh, in the z direction. And then the other two axes are, you know, the a and b. But I think that you saw the installation during the installation of the sensor. Uh, Marking the azimuth of the the direction that the sensor was installed, there's a, a reference X mark on the shape array, and uh, so so referencing it into the typical A and B axes of the the installation is really important. Um, uh, as you'll see in in this part of the presentation about the sense metrics visualization side, I think that you'll see some of those uh, uh, applications of uh, you know exactly how to to view the data. Um, this is where it really uh, comes into its own here. So. Um, I think we can move into that and then uh, come back to the, to the questions um, in the Q&A period. So, so with regard to that, uh, when when you get the, the raw data, it's processed through the shape arrays algorithm and it outputs a position of the, the actual each segment uh, with, with the position in the hole. Um, and then that can be displayed in the sense metrics visualization. So, what you end up getting is this view where you see the the deformation over time, the movements of that those sensors inside the borehole. So if you have a a landslide or uh, tailings consolidation or pit wall movement, block movement, you're going to see at a very high fidelity the the movement on a segment by segment basis. And you can look at that a couple of different ways. As I mentioned, if you insert the the azimuth of that X mark into the to the sense metric software, you can start to visualize typical delta X, delta Y uh, positions. You can look at it in whatever units you would like. Uh, you can you can you know decide how how long of a time period you want to look. So usually there's a uh, after drilling a borehole and installing the shape array, 
there's a period of days where it's setting up. Maybe the grout around the, the borehole is in, install, uh, consolidating or curing. Um, you can actually you know, get an idea of, of what that cure looks like, how straight your borehole was, uh, you know, those early installation phases where you are taking data right away. It's, it's valuable to have that information about how your hole was installed. And then you have this, this long-term uh, measurement device where you can then you know, track that movement over time and, and start to, to get insights about, you know, do I have certain segments moving? Uh, do I, are there soft zones that we're worried about? Uh, what are, how fast are they moving? Uh, and you can be, be putting that into time series or downhole visualizations within the Sensemetric software uh, very easily. So, so having that up and, and, and having it you know, trackable through time, uh, also connected up to alerting, so you know if you have displacements that are above either a, a total displacement, a cumulative displacement, an incremental displacement, or a, even a velocity. Uh, we, we have all of those metrics available and, and all of that uh, can be configured within the system and, and customized into these dashboards uh, for how you wanna view your project. So, so as you put together, you know, all of this data into one package and, and start to place it into a map, uh, be able to look at, at uh, our slope deformation mode, which shows a, a azimuth uh, and magnitude of a displacement. You see these vector tails where you can color code them for how much uh, deformation has occurred as, as well as the direction. Uh, and then I mentioned, I'll just kind of bring it back to this idea that uh, the shape array is a, this great sensor and it's very valuable. Uh, and, and it becomes more valuable when you can then view it in the context of other sensors. So this is a case where we have a tailing stem instrumented with GPS uh, deformation directions. So we can compare the deformation in the subsurface to deformation above ground uh, and, and look at that you know, with prism systems, with inclinometers, with settlements, and even having things like piezometer data is, is very valuable at evaluating what the factors of, of concern are for, for monitoring a project. So, so Sensemetrics has really excelled at being able to put a, 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 an all-in-one view with the same analytical frame for uh, sensors like the, the the shape array as well as then put it all together uh, with all of the other sensors that are available on a project and the you know one of the important parts here that we've discussed is uh, data ownership uh, so so exporting the the data is always something that that you have that capability of um, and Chris, you had mentioned uh, before about you know the kind of way that you you can manually look at your data. Maybe just talk a little bit about how that works with if if a user wants to manually look at their data with your software through the Sensemetrics platform. Yeah, so thanks, Ben. So we uh, at MeasureEnd we have our own software. It's called SA Suite. It's available for for download directly from our website. It is uh, obviously specifically tailored to uh, visualize, uh, analyze, diagnose, shape rays, and shape ray data. Um, so just because you may be using the uh, Sensemetrics platform doesn't mean you still can't utilize our software. So you can, what a great feature is you can go into, like go into the Sensemetrics platform, you can see the data, you can look at um, how things may be behaving. And then if you wanna do some really deep diagnosis of the data, you can uh, download the DAT file, import that into SA Suite, and you can continue working uh, on your PC like you normally would. So I like, I really like to promote that option to clients when they're wondering about how they can uh, dig into the data a little bit deeper if they need to. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's a really important aspect for us too on just, you know, maintaining that sort of data chain of custody uh, that that it's traceable and you can analyze it in whatever software you want and that we we keep the raw data whenever possible. Um, one of the questions that came through is this idea of like where wh where the data is accessible uh, and, and how it's connected. Um, uh, let me just see here. I think the question was, is it possible to download the data from the thread? Um, we actually, so we, we just released a, uh, in the process of releasing a mobile app that allows for uh, configuration of, of data uh, at, the, at the location, but 
Um, we've actually, by design, uh, made sure that, that you can't just connect to the thread and download it uh, onto a USB drive. We actually want to remove that model for, for working. It's not a traditional data logger. Uh, threads can collect data and uh, they will store it locally on, on their system uh, until they have a connection to the cloud. That can be established a couple of different ways. I actually know there's a couple of people on the call right now who have helped us achieve that telemetry uh, to the cloud application um, through either uh, external radios when the, the cell networks are down or uh, even satellite modems uh, we have as a capability. So um, that's by design because we want to make sure that the data goes into the to the cloud application with, you know, that, that it's, it has high integrity. There's no way to change it. There's no uh, you know, question of, of what the source, the source of truth is with the data. Um, but, but all of this is designed, you know, one of the things that we do when we work with a project is uh, we look at the application, we look at the data going, uh, moving around a, a site, and we design a, a project that for redundant pathways uh, up to the cloud. So uh, there might be a few gateways, um, each thread itself, uh, there's a question about uh, if it's directly connected to the cloud or if it's a central hub, each thread can function as both. So it can function as an end node that doesn't have any cell phone coverage. It can function as a repeater or it can function as a gateway that is pushing the data to the cloud. And the fact that you don't have to you know, buy different parts or configure different uh, systems just makes it easier on the installation. The vast majority of our, our installs, the, the threads are directly connected to the cloud and just forwarding their data uh, with a, a single single route. But it's nice to have a mesh network that uh, can, can uh, intelligently figure out the best way out of the cloud. So when you lose a, a site, uh, maybe it's blocked, maybe there's a, a situation where you lose the main gateway, the, the mesh auto reconfigures itself and uh, is able to, to uh, ferry that, that data back up to the cloud securely and also give an alert if, if you don't have data uh, for some period of time to, to investigate further and establish that telemetry. Alex, uh, I, I think that you had some, some comments on uh, the alerting capabilities of the platform. Yeah, absolutely, Ben, great conversation. I think uh, you know accessibility and flexibility with regards to your data is so important, but data becomes even more useful when you're able to take action. Uh, so with our alerting functionality, you are able to automatically receive real-time notifications uh, containing calculation metrics and sensor status uh, when a sensor when sensor data reaches a user-defined uh, threshold. Uh, these alerts can easily be labeled, they can be grouped, they can prioritize, be prioritized, and they're easily searchable um, in the event that you're looking for a particular alert. Um, so, so alerts can be set for multiple sensors and, and for multiple trigger criteria, as you can see in the bottom right hand there of that screen capture. And because we have that thread edge computing device, that the computer out in the field, we actually can start to do interesting things based on these alerts. So, so we can send commands back into the network um, to all of the sensors, to a subset of a specific group of sensors, um, or, to, or to a very specific sensor. Um, and we can tell them to do certain actions based on, on certain events. And we've got a fantastic tailing stamp study, um, case study coming up that, that really uh, drives that point home and really speaks about the success of, of being able to communicate back into the, uh, the network. So, yeah, this is, this is a case where uh, uh, we have a, a really important combination of everything that we've talked about today. So the plug and play functionality, the edge computing model, and then all the way up to, to uh, sending the data in through the API to an external application. So I wanted to kind of put that together as a as kind of capstone for this conversation. Uh, and then we can get into all of these great questions that are coming in on the, 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 the question side. So this is a case where there was a, a question of uh, doing a damage assessment after an earthquake uh, using the Shaper Egg. And uh, it, what the SenseMetrics platform is, is able to do in this case is uh, we're, we're able to, to set alerts and alarms off of any type of sensor that's in our network. So those could be pisometers, those could be a rain event, 
Those could be uh, an earthquake. And so in this case, if, if we have a, a peak acceleration velocity that is monitored on a seismograph, a strong motion accelerograph, uh, we can we can start doing interesting things with our network. So if, if uh, nominally we're having uh, hourly measurements on our entire network, that means shape arrays, piezometers, all of these things are collecting data once an hour. Uh, if that earthquake hits, that's a, a change that we want to investigate really quickly. We want engineers to be able to rapidly assess the the earthquake as to you know how much damage did it cause on on the structure. Is it uh, you know what decisions do we need to make in real time? So instead of waiting for that data to continue to collect uh, another you know three hours, if if you want to start doing trending, you know getting three points on a line. Would be uh, would be the time frame where you would want to get those three measurements. Uh, you might be in a situation with a passive kind of data logger model where you're just you're just collecting that on an hourly basis and, and you wait for three or four hours before you can make a decision. But the edge computing model allows the the network to wake itself up, go into a high power mode, and start collecting uh, measurements once a minute. On, on the shape arrays, piezometers, whatever other network is, uh, sensors are connected to that network. And so it kind of goes into this high visibility, high activity measurement mode where you can start measuring things really fast and start making decisions using those three data points in three to four minutes instead of three to four hours. So, so intelligently throttling the, the measurement frequency here becomes this great application where you're kind of working with the sensors to to wake up and, and start measuring frequently during times where you need that information very fast. Uh, in, in this case, uh, you know, not only do you have the site uh, staff that can punch into the system and see what, what's happening on the site, but engineers of record that might be, you know, in different countries, in different parts of the world, they can all log in and see the same data and start to, to evaluate that. So, so the next stage of this uh, case study was that, uh, you know, well, we actually want to go and take that and, and move this into uh, shaking analysis or factor of safety analysis based on changes that we're seeing in water levels or uh, the actual deformation of the shape array. And so uh, one of the tools that, that we've plugged into the system uh, are these, these modeling uh, packages actually have access to real-time data through our API. So a few of these modeling packages have buttons where you just press uh, update and you can uh, update your model with real-time values of, of deformations, real-time values of uh, groundwater levels, and, and then run your analysis based on that real-time data that, that could be changing rapidly. Um, so that's, and, and then that, the results of that real-time analysis can then be put back into the sense metrics view frame and evaluated against the other data sets. So if you have a factor of safety analysis that is influenced by you know primarily water levels and you want to then output your factor of safety maps as you see in, in this view here, you can you know update those maps and then evaluate are we actually seeing deformations at our low factors of safety? You know, are we seeing that there's movements here? Is it does it mean that we have to make different types of decisions in real time because we have access to that data? Uh, and and just to kind of you know, I've been in the situation where I'm doing that type of analysis, and uh, you know, you have to ask for the data to be collected, you have to ask for the data to be forwarded, you have to upload it, uh, transform it, clean it up, wrangle data scrub the data, uh, all of those steps are taken out of the equation and you can focus on the decision making of the, the engineering concepts of, you know, is fundamentally, are we, is our model well calibrated? Is our, is our model performing the, the task of, of evaluating the factor of safety effectively and not on the, the data wrangling and the, the, the data transformation steps? So, this is, it's, it really encapsulates the idea of what SenseMetrics and MeasureEnd have tried to achieve with their collaboration here is that we wanna get the data in people's hands as quickly as possible to an actionable intelligence, to decision-making as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. And I think that in this case, it's a, it's a real success story for, for how the, the technology is used uh, within our two companies. And uh, we really enjoy working together from, from that perspective.
So uh, with that, I, I think that we're we're wrapping up and we're moving into this Q and A session. I'm seeing lots of lots of great uh, questions here. Um, I'm going to take a breath and uh, uh, let um, someone start to field these questions as they're they're coming up here. Yeah, thanks, Ben. That was that was uh, really really good. I was going to chime in a few times, but you just uh, kept answering every question I was going to say. So that was fantastic. Thanks, um, Shane. Is there any of the kind of questions that came in that you answered as we were going along that maybe everyone would um, be interested in? Yeah, there's a couple of great ones. Um, probably uh, the first one we would like to discuss is the reusability of the instrument. Um, so we had a great question about whether or not the instrument could be retrieved uh, and reused in other applications. Uh, and in most cases, it totally can, um, as any deformation monitoring instrument ha has to be worried about. It's really going to depend on the amount of deformation that the instrument sees uh, during the monitoring project. Uh, and kind of how tight of a shear zone uh, it encounters. Uh, but in most cases, um, depending on the, the amount of deformation you've seen, uh, the reusability of the instrument is there. You can retrieve it, put it back on the reel, take it to the next site, uh, and install it again. Um, we also had a great question about whether or not the instrument is uh, usable underwater. Uh, and it totally is. Uh, we've had many clients uh, have underwater installations um, go flawlessly and work well. Uh, the instrument is totally waterproof. Um, if you have an underwater application in mind, uh, definitely reach out to us and, and we'll be happy to talk to you about uh, how you would properly uh, install one underwater. Yeah, that's a great, great point, Shane. Uh, there's a few case studies on our website of horizontal installations on seabeds. Um, and typically, actually, when most uh, vertical installations are installed, uh, there's always typically water in the casing, so that's not an issue. Uh, Alex or Ben, is there any kind of centimetrics thread questions you want? You thought everyone might want to want to know about? If not, I can just keep going. Sure, no, there's a, there's a couple of good ones in here. Uh, let me just see where to start. So um, some of the, the questions about the details of the installation uh, that I'll, I'll just address here. Um, to be clear, the, the uh, plug and play capability that, that we described, it really is only a, a thread uh, shape array and the, the, sent the cable in between them. There's no data loggers in between. Uh, it is as simple as that. Um, and so, so we have uh, really collapsed that that complexity. All of that goes into the thread, and the thread powers the the shape array. There's an onboard battery, uh, and usually a solar panel that that uh, mines that that battery voltage and uh, applies, you know, charges the powers the sensor and allows the readings to be taken. Um, so, so that's an important component. Uh, there's one question about uh, uh, verticality in here uh i think that i understand that the question is you know if you actually have a borehole that drifts uh from from strictly vertical uh the way that the the technology works is that you, you know you can both sense what that that drift is what that deviation from the vertical is through the positioning uh, metric and sense metrics but you can also then baseline yourself and say okay so from this date i want to i want to watch the deformation that has occurred from this date, uh, rather than it being from a strictly vertical uh, consideration. So, um, you know, one of the the uh, you know questions of uh, just monitoring your your movement, um, it always can be referenced to a specific baseline date. It can be monitored on a rolling average. Uh, you can be looking at it from from a lots of different trending views, and we're happy to to hop onto a, a webinar together and and look at you know what exactly those those capabilities are. Um, there's also this uh, question that came out about uh, how the thread stores the data and how it forwards it. Um, so just to be clear, uh, there's an onboard storage of the data inside the thread, uh, usually. That, that storage is not used because it's connected to the cloud. But if there is an interruption in data, there is onboard storage that will collect and then forward that data when the, the connection to the cloud is reestablished. 
Yeah, that's a really important point, Ben. Uh, we've got another question here um, saying, do we need to buy the measure and data logger and sense metrics thread to work? Or do I just need the sense metrics thread? Yeah, and uh, in that case, the uh, there there isn't any other components. It's it's just the uh, the thread, the power system for the thread, and then the shape array uh, in the whole. And and we can you know we're we're always collaborating with the Measurand team at uh, looking at a project. Uh, we saw emails coming across this morning about okay, here's how we're going to price it out, and and here's how we can you know just deliver that in a in a one-stop type of shop. So we're happy to to, to work with the, the measure and team on that side. We also had a great question in here on whether or not there was any analysis done to demonstrate whether uh, the results from uh, measure and SA suite software and the sense metrics platforms outputs were the same. Uh, and I'd just like to chime in there and say, uh, I don't believe we have any white papers specifically that address this, but the conversion algorithms that are being used in the sense metrics platforms are exactly the same ones that are being used in SAA suite. So the results you get from, from processing uh, raw data from the instrument um, in either uh, using either software are, are going to be identical. Yeah, and I really appreciate that question. Uh, because it, it it is a it's always an important process to go through that sort of traceability of uh, you know since metrics has really prioritized the the in in browser configuration of things like uh, you know not not just the X mark so making sure that the X mark uh, azimuth is recorded properly but that uh, you know then you're not configuring the any structural azimuths like the the direction of the crest of a tailings dam or uh, a dam embankment, um, you know, programming those in, that's all accessible by the user and configurable uh, by the user themselves. There's no back end that has to be kind of tended to by, by a third party or a support team. Um, you know, that's, that's all accessible to the user uh, and, and the engineer so that they can know that the answers that they're they're getting out of the system are as reliable as as they've configured it uh, to be, and and that's an important component of, of our platform. Just from a philosophical standpoint, is that we want that traceability, we want that transparency of of both the raw data and the transformations happening to it as much as possible. So uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, that question. I uh, had another question about the accuracy of the shape array. Uh, and for our SAAV product, um, the accuracy is plus or minus 1.5 millimeters uh, per 32 meter sensorized length um, for cumulative uh, deformation. Um, this scales roughly with the length sensorized, uh, sorry, scales uh, with the square root of the sensorized length. Um, so if you have a specific length of shape array in mind, um, please feel free to contact us and we will, uh, we'll, we can give you a more precise value for the, the length of instrument you're exactly looking for. Here's an, uh, an easy question that I, I'd like to just uh, address this idea of uh, configuring alerts. Um, so, depending on the connectivity of your your device, uh, you know we're we're often standing at the the installation site and configuring the device uh, directly there. We do have some options that we're introducing that allows the mobile device to make that even easier. And so, you know, generally, you know, being able to to be on the phone, uh, configuring it on an iPad, configuring it on a laptop. And, and having an entire team look at it with you, whether they're remote or or local, it allows for a lot of flexibility that uh, you know you can configure that correctly, and that you're not changing the raw data. So if you ever make a mistake, you can you can change uh, those configurations. And actually, through our our global event management system, uh, you actually can log those events on how when you've changed the configuration. What you've changed them from and to, and it just allows for a really 
great record of the 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 sensor made metadata and how how you're uh, uh, reporting those calculations. Excellent, Ben. Uh, one one more question here from from Mohammed. Um, asking, will the Campbell Scientific Communications and Data Logger technology be eliminated with the introduction of this sense metrics technology? Yeah, well, that's uh, that's uh, just right into the 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 the, the meat of, of the option here. I can't say anything about uh, what what will happen to Campbell. Um, I haven't had to use Campbell since I've, I've joined Sense Metrics, and uh, I'm really pr proud about the installation where. We can do it in such a, a, a nice little package. Um, the you know inside the thread, the telemetry, the radio, the charge controller, the battery, all of this is collapsed in that that nice little white box that usually is in a uh, you know an instrumentation cabinet that requires you know an entire wiring diagram and all of these things that you know you've traditionally had to to make up uh, if you've been an instrument integrator. So uh, just in practice, what that means, um, Alex, you referenced it in your presentation that uh, the amount of time, the amount of overhead you spend building those boxes, maintaining those boxes, updating firmware for each individual device, we, we've really collapsed that into you know, a single, single device and a single sensor. And that allows for a, a huge efficiency to be made. And, and I think it, it changes the way that you're you're interacting with sensors and instruments because it, it, you have the realization that you can do it faster, you can do more projects, you can you know, uh, turn around data quicker. And uh, it's just one of these things that is, as an engineer, a really pleasurable place to be, uh, to have data accessible so quickly and, and start making decisions off of it instead of spending endless time you know, uh, working with uh, maintaining the system. Okay, so I think that uh, we're, we're about wrapped up on the Q and A. Um, I want to just say that uh, you know appreciate everybody joining the call. Uh, we're, we're accessible on on LinkedIn. Our websites are are at uh, www.sensemetrics.com and also at MeasureEnd. Uh, really appreciate it. Please reach out to us if you have any questions about projects. Um, uh, really appreciate. Uh, the chance to, to present with our good friends at Measure End. Uh, so, so Chris and, and Shane, thank you very much for for the chance to, to get in front of you guys and for everyone who attended the web, attended the webinar. Yeah, seconded on our side. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, and to everyone who asked questions, uh, if we didn't get to it during the presentation, we will follow up uh, with you 